Thanks for having me here today. Um, Matthew, thank you for organizing this. And, um, I find it exciting to be coming into a community of scholarship and uh, just sort of writerly interest that is so vibrant. And I appreciate your part in that and, and making it so vibrant. Um, so I, um, you heard that I, my other book is on Lily Smith, and some people have said, what is it with you and the Smith sisters? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't really mean to do that. But I wanted to um, sort of shift gears and start working on somebody that was more local and learn a little bit more about Georgia literature. And so I, I just sort of started looking at the um, Georgia Writers Hall of Fame and, and those kinds of places and thinking about the writers that I've never taught, the writers that I've never even read, who have had such an impact on Georgia and on the South and on the world, really. So um, it's been really exciting to have stumbled onto Lillian Smith and then found you know, such a treasure. I can tell from the breakfast conversation that really I'm going to be preaching to the choir here. So um, that's kind of nice. Have you had to live out there? Hopefully. Um, so um, I hope this is oh, nice. Okay. So today we're going to recognize the many important roles that Smith played during her lifetime, um, including the ones listed here. Uh, for those who find it odd that I included the camp director, Smith ran the Laurel Falls camp for girls, specifically white girls, in the North Georgia mountains from 1925 to 1948 exerting a significant influence over a generation of young women, as Matthew has pointed out. Um, the context for this paper is, uh, it is one of the chapters, it comes from one of the chapters in the uh, critical essays on uh, the writings of William Smith that we are putting together. Um, as Matthew said, Emily has a piece in that. Um, we have... Uh, People from all over contributing, which again speaks to, you know, the, uh, I guess, I don't know if I want to use the word universality, but the sort of, the, the, the impact that Smith has really across the world. One of our contributors is in Poland. He was, some of you heard him in September. He's sort of doing his tour, I guess, of the U.S. right now. But he talked about how much um, Killers of the Dream really spoke to his Polish students and to him. So I think the things she writes about really do speak to the human experience and um, things that happen, continue to happen, uh, that maybe we wish wouldn't, but <clears throat> that are still uh, important to study. Um, so um, based on my research so far on Smith, it seems to me that the reason that her writing has not been more widely recognized for its literary merits during her lifetime and in the years that followed, is that the new critics, also known as the formalists, who dominated the field of literature during the first part of the 20th century, believe that great works should combine content and form to produce a sublime experience for readers, tapping into the universal human experience. They felt that overly political writing is too tied to time and place, to transcend it, and hence to endure. Um, of course, with the development of the civil rights movement and postmodernism in the 1950s and 60s, the idea was forwarded that all literature is political, and uh, that what had been described as universal was really the experience of Western white males. Yet Smith's work would not have fit the expectation of postmodernists either, really, I think, who looked to the highly experimental narrative and or clearly marginalized voices to challenge traditional literature and what we now call the grand narrative. I think that the reconsideration of literature's ethical role in the last couple of decades is allowing us to finally consider the ways that Smith powerfully combined artistry and activism. So the book that we're putting together um, is meant to kind of fill the gap. Um, you know, there's been some amazing work that's been done already on Smith, and I just have to give a shout out to Rose Gladney. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, she complained always, I think everybody that's written about her says this, that she, she complained, as Smith complained, that she wasn't really being treated as a writer. She was being treated as an activist, and she was both. But I think she has not been maybe recognized enough for the 
uh, for her aesthetic. Um, and the, uh, I think, which is every bit as sophisticated as people like Faulkner and uh, Flannery O'Connor and people that have been anthologized and taught a lot uh, as, you know, the legacy of American letters. So I would like, I'm hoping to help pull her into um, those kind of conversations more and maybe I'm going to be teaching her in the spring in my American Lit course, but I'm going to have to make copies of the stuff I teach because it's not in the norm. So um, hopefully we can change that. Um, Smith's first published book, Strange Fruit, generated great public acclaim with its appearance in 1944. Tracing the tragic love affair of a black woman and a white man, each trying to navigate the mores of a small southern town, the novel quickly became a bestseller and its censorship by the U.S. Postal Service only increased its capital as a literary tour de force. Yet this book was her only bestseller, and she would go on to become known mostly for her social commentary. Over the next two decades, Smith went on to publish six more books, along with many articles and letters. Yet her reputation during her lifetime, and for many years afterwards, sprang primarily from her activism rather than her literary accomplishment. You guys, please tell me if I click this and nothing happens, okay? I hope the right slide's behind me. Today's presentation, a distilled version of Chapter 1 in the forthcoming book of Critical Essays, examines strange fruit through a lens of border and whiteness theories, exploring Smith's use of geographical markers in the fictional Maxwell, Georgia, to reveal their influence on characters' physical movements, as well as on their psychological navigation of a hometown, strictly dictating their behaviors. So um, probably, as most of you know, Smith was born in Jasper, Florida in 1897 uh, to a relatively privileged family. She was the seventh child of nine, and uh, she based, by all accounts, she seems to have based the town of Maxwell, Georgia, on Jasper, Florida. Three of Strange Fruit's characters, Nani, Bess, and Eddie Anderson, remember well the lessons they learned from their mother, Tilly, as African-American children growing up just outside Maxwell, Georgia, in Blacktown. Quote, Tilly's children, looking up into the brown, strong, sweating face above them, listening to her words, thrust their roots more firmly into that soil out of which they had come. Quote. In this story, Smith explores the taboos of 1920s small-town Georgia life, unveiling the violence that underlies often neurotic relationships of communities like that of the fictional Maxwell, Georgia. Through her development of the border metaphor in the novel, Smith argues that Southern slavery and the Jim Crow laws that followed deform all who participate in them, black as well as white. Tracing the interactions of Maxwell's residents, Strange Fruit acknowledges that people desire both a safe and secure home for themselves and their loved ones, as well as to engage in the world at large. On the face of it, these two dreams are not mutually exclusive. But Smith emphasizes pursuit of them is inevitably complicated by economic and psychological factors which, if not recognized as such, can coalesce into rigid social structures positioning these two goals in opposition to one another. As the novel illustrates, such structures are often perpetuated under the guise of moral and religious codes and or as natural law. And the neuroses that shape them are the more generous for being hidden and hence unarticulated. In most towns, however, these systems are manifested visibly in physical boundaries. Although these boundaries are often accepted initially as a way to provide stability to human existence, they can result in stifling environments that stunt rather than nourish and protect. Under such circumstances, those of the lower castes, such as the Andersons, as well as higher status community members like the Deans, become strange fruit. On its face, Maxwell appears to be a tightly knit community of good natured, caring people living and working together in near harmony. However, viewed as a map, the town reveals systematic divide and conquer practices that keep everyone in his or her place, often at the price of res residents' mental well-being and sometimes even of their lives. 
Central to Maxwell is College Street, where well-respected white families live, and on which uh, some run businesses, like the Dean's Corner Drug Store. In the alley behind College Street, the garbage of the stores is piled to preserve clean and tidy storefronts, and the town's black residents generally traverse this parallel back street rather than College Street's sidewalks. On Back Street, Salamanders offers a lunch counter to black customers who cannot patronize that of Dean's Drugstore. At the end of Back Street, Brown's Hardware Store and Pub Pussy's Supply Store sit near Maxwell's water tank, and nearby, freight is hauled in and out of the area on trains. Although, techni oh, sorry, although technically part of White Town, these border areas are characterized by racially mixed commercial interactions that enable a complex economy to function. African American delivery boys come and go, workers purchase items needed for turpentine farms and lumber mills, money passing through the hands of rich and poor, black and white alike. On the outer edges of Maxwell lie the town's ball grounds, one for whites and one for blacks. In these male sporting venues, the classes of each race mix more freely than in restaurants, offices, and churches, though black and white men still do not play with or against each other on these grounds. Walking home from town, the Andersons pass ball fields, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Evergreen Cemetery, where white dead are buried, quote, an ancient row of cedars, and the house of the sweet, though mentally ill, Miss Ada, before coming to Blacktown the entrance to which is marked by a picket gate. Interestingly, the original site of Jasper, Florida is said to have been a few miles south of where it is today, where the actual Evergreen Cemetery is now located. While the home of Miss Ada and her elderly mother is in a ramshackle state as the story begins, the house's situation at the end of the ancient row of cedars near the cemetery suggests that her family at one time held a prominent place in the community. Although Maxwellians not identifying as white do not live in White Town, except in rare cases, there are recognizable class boundaries in Black Town itself. Near the edge of the swamp, both beautiful and haunted, the Andersons live in a rundown two-story house just behind the picket gate in Miss Ada's house. In fact, Miss Ada watches Bess's son, Jackie, when Bess is working as a maid for the Browns. Since Miss Ada is considered crazy, the townspeople do not find this racial overlap offensive, though many of them do consider Spelman, edu the Spelman educated Anderson sisters bigoty. <laughs> um, further out of town uh, are the Negro quarters and the mill settlements populated by poor white workers who often compete with their black counterparts for the manual labor jobs on farms and mills. Though Maxwell's borders are relatively fixed during the 1920s uh, time frame of Strange Fruit, there's some movement of whites in Blacktown and vice versa. It is understood by the townspeople that many white Maxwell men have lovers in Blacktown. Middle class white men generally walk the paths of this section without fear, since their families and white associates often employ the people who live there. Black men and women can walk in College Street and its side neighborhoods as well, but only for work. Each morning, Bess, Nani, and other women in maids uniforms make the trek to the homes in this area to clean house, cook, and take care of white children. As an exception to the rules associated with these geographical markers, Henry McIntosh, who is black, lives in the servant's cabin behind the dean's big yellow house, as his mother and father did before him. When his parents, Mamie and Tim, faced the decision of whether to leave their 13-year-old Henry to live in the cabin or to take him with them to Baxley to farm cotton, Mamie argued for leaving him with the deans so he could go to school. Tim's expression of frustration about the arrangements reveals the unique tensions of living across the line from one's own social group. Quote, hate living in Deke's backyard. Told you a hundred times it'd be better in the quarters where we'd be free to do as we like. I don't want my boy growing up with no white boy. Don't want none of it, end quote. Yet Henry, attached to the humble backyard house as the only home he's ever known, and to Tracy as a sort of surrogate brother, 
stays and remains houseboy to the deans even after becoming a grown man. Smith's story of, of the South's strange fruit arises from a plot involving two young lovers, Nani Anderson and Tracy Dean. Tracy, who is ultimately unable to sustain his commitment to Nani in the face of pressures from his family and friends to take the right path, and uh, marry Dorothy Pusey, pays his friend's servant, Henry, to marry the pregnant Nani, and is shot and killed by, Nani, uh, by Nani's infuriated brother, Ed, as a result. Ed's sister, Bess, foreseeing local outrage over the murder of a white man in Blacktown, arranges with their friend, Sam Perry, to get Ed quickly out of town, and uh, rather than wait for an investigation or a trial, a white mob of Maxwell locals lynches and burns the easily targeted Henry for the murder. This plot, tracing the movement of black and white characters around and across Maxwell's boundaries, illustrates well how those borders serve both literally and symbolically to determine the paths of the novel's characters and ultimately to deform them psychologically. On Globe, Maxwell would not seem to be the center of anything, really. Um, in the southeast corner of the U.S., its place on the earth is not a common orientation point or destination for travel. For young men like Ed Anderson and Tracy Dean, fighting in Europe during World War I, the perspective offered from across the Atlantic is enlightening. Ed has, as a result of leaving Maxwell and utilizing his talents for the U.S. government, developed into a confident and dignified man, disdainful of anyone who considers him otherwise. Disgusted by Maxwell's continued segregation and the degradation it causes, he argues that his youngest sister, Nani, should return with him to Washington, D.C. to find more dignified work. Tracy found psychological freedom from Maxwell's inflexible mindset during his time in France as well. Quote, months in the Ruhr Valley left you time to think cut off from everything that makes it hard to think at home. It was easier, end quote. Here, beyond the mental and behavioral conditioning of Maxwell, he realizes that he's in love with Nani, the lovely young black woman that he has known most of his life. His love provides him with a new point by which to orient himself. Quote, he saw her, tender and beautiful, holding in her eyes her pliant spirit in the movement of her body, her easy right words, low, deep voice, all that gave his life meaning, end quote. Back in Maxwell with Nani, beginning to feel the tentacles of whiteness tighten around him once more, Tracy suggests offhandedly that he and Nani might move back to France together, suggesting for Nani a new notion of existence. Quote, when he said the word, something happened to Nani's face, and he was startled, as if he had lighted 10,000 candles with one small half thought out word. Nani's attachment to Tracy is based, at least in part, on the broadened worldly perspective that the relationship opens up for her. Not only did he protect her from the advances of little white boys when she was a child, he also talked to her about the world outside hers. She strives to describe for Tracy his effect on her. Quote, you told me about the other side of the world, geography. I didn't know a thing about that. Although Tracy flunked out of college, his understanding of the world, fostered by his parents, teachers, and experience, fires Nani's imagination in a way that even her Spelman education could not. Opportunities for Spelman's female graduates were definitely limited in the 1920s, and women like Nani and Bess would have faced disproportionate challenges, economic and otherwise, even after obtaining a much-desired college degree. Nani might reasonably consider Tracy's momentary fantasy of taking her back to France with him as a promising possibility for a more fulfilling life. In spite of Tracy's failure to follow through with the idea, his role in opening to her a new psychological world secures him her devotion. Ed, Tracy, and Nani all imagine a freer existence outside the confines of their Georgia hometown, but Maxwell has a strong hold on the novel's characters. Its centrality to their psychic maps overrides its obscure global position and their desires to escape it. It is home for them. When Ed expresses dismay that his, sister would, his sisters would stay in this dump, as he calls it, even after their mother has died, 
Bess tries to articulate for herself why she does so. Quote, moss trailing in your face when you're little. You'd make great pillows of it, flop down in them, feeling luxurious and rich. Oak trees you couldn't reach around. Thickets of yellow jasmine and violets, flycatchers in low marshy places. That's the way you feel about the place you were born. Always looking for it, always staying or coming back, searching for the you you left there. Ed is resolute in his refusal to live in the Georgia town where he grew up, feeling distinctly <laughs> diminished when he is there. Stephen A. Reich describes the great black migration of African Americans from the rural South cities to, to sorry, from the rural South to cities such as New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. during and after World War I. Quote, race was obviously the common denominator in determinations to migrate but motives were often filtered through the gender identities of black men and women. The pernicious characteristics of Jim Crow race relations, disenfranchisement, segregation, and economic mar marginalization militated against African-American men's claims to the status of manhood as it was de defined by the dominant culture." End quote. Ed's aversion to Maxwell reflects this dynamic. Facing College Street, quote, now he looked straight into Georgia. White girls in cars blew horns, ordered cokes, laughed, crossed their legs, uncrossed them, stared through him as their line of vision passed his body. He was a black digit marked out by white chalk. He wasn't there on the sidewalk. He had never been there. He just wasn't anywhere where those eyes looked, end quote. Yet Bess recognizes that Ed will be able, uh, sorry, unable to shake his connection with Maxwell, even after he has shot Tracy and is fleeing for New York. Quote, even if he were safe, even if he escaped, he'd still have to come back in his mind and look at that white man he killed. Sooner or later, he would have to do that. And when he did, when he made that journey back, something would happen inside him and it wouldn't be good. Ed's confusion, the strong pullback to Maxwell juxtaposed against feelings of humiliation associated with the place, reflects gender identity's complication of race and geography. It's difficult to say whether whiteness or manliness is more, a more dominant factor of privilege in social structures like Maxwell, where relatively kind white men like Tom Harris believe that the best way to prevent violence in the area would be to, quote, Bring a drove of black women in there to the chain gang's camp, uh, camp once a week, end quote. While Ed must avoid even looking at white women and girls, or face consequences as brave as lynching, even white women pay a high price for their access to College Street, trading their sexuality, psychological integrity, and the happiness of their loved ones for status, stability, and security. Smith's portrayal of Tracy's mother, Alma Dean, seems at times an outright condemnation of such women who seem to choke out of their husbands and children their sexual energy, intellectual rigor, and idealism. Alma has never been able to even enjoy conjugal sex, disgusted by bodily fluids and smells, even in her own children. Aside from Henry McIntosh's lynching, Alma's willingness to sacrifice Tracy's happiness for the sake of the family's social position seems one of the most intentional and brutal applications in the novel of White Town's strict code. She seems to have embraced her social role willingly, though her own mother's discouragement of uh, intellectual pursuits did limit her choices. When young Tut Dean, just out of medical school with the, hard, the ink hardly dry on his state license, asked her to marry him, it was for Alma as if someone had opened a gate which led down a faraway road. Her ambition has sharpened her edges, making her formidable even to her own husband and children. Yet one telltale remnant of the Alma who existed before coming to Maxwell is her wish for her daughter Laura to earn a PhD and teach in a university, though it would mean Laura's settling away from home. This notion evidences Alma's understanding on some level that Maxwell's boundaries ultimately strangle the humanity out of even women like herself. Not only does her role preclude sexual sexuality, sorry, what did I just say? Preclude authentic sexuality <laughs> and philosophical integrity, but she must also serve as the scapegoat for men like her own husband, 
who thinks of her as an immovable cow, though she has, uh, to a great extent, held together his medical practice and, and household their whole married life. This complicated tangle of per perpetrator and victim, insider and outsider, confirms Smith's assertion that no one in such a system goes unscathed. All suffer psychological damage as a result. And although crossing the Mason-Dixon line appeals to Ed and many other African Americans tired of navigating geographies such as Maxwell's, leaving may not provide the wholeness they desire. Johnson and Michelson explain, quote, identities don't travel well, they don't work well abroad, and home too is always foreign, always on the other side of the border, end quote. Further, Ed's expectation of opportunity for Nani in the North carries some naivety since her gender would undoubtedly factor into her experience there, as it has for him. Dynamics of mobility are complicated by the notion of gendered places, for example. Unlike Tracy or Ed, Nani is not more likely to find safety and security in the North than in the South, if she does not understand the codes embedded in its particular and complex environments. Rachel Silvey explains in her article, Geographies of Gender and Migration, Spatializing Social Difference, that, quote, women are often othered at night or in public places. The structures of gender, race, and class play into determining whose bodies belong where, how different social groups subjectively experience various environments, that is, who feels safe in public places, so-called public, powerful in alleyways, at home in red light districts, afraid in the suburbs, or in place in the central city, and what sorts of exclusionary and disciplinary techniques are applied to specific bodies." End quote. In light of such conditions, the choice of Alma, Bess, Laura, and Nani to stay in Maxwell may be founded on logic beyond an attachment to home. Sylvie argues, for example, that, quote, if, if African American women can use their spatial rootedness in, in a community to their advantage, this suggests that pre-given conceptions of mobility as power and immobility as oppression require further investigation, end quote. I mean, a good example of that is that Bess uh, has a babysitter right down the street who's, who's white and willing to watch her child while she works. <clears throat> that Lillian Smith her, herself chose to live and work in the South while caring for aging parents and running the girls' camp her father had founded support Strange Fruit's implication that the path to healing may require rooting out the problem from within. Although whiteness theory is relatively young as a tool for addressing racism, Smith alleges in Now is the Time that white people as a social class are, quote, arrogant in our overestimation of whiteness, end quote. That she labels whiteness as a position in this 1955 treatise is a crucial step in the process of disrupting white domination. The territory of white town is rarely named aloud in the novel, which reveals much about the kinds of boundaries that rule Maxwell. Johnson and Michelson use the term soft borders to refer to unofficial geographical lines, like the ones marking white town. Except for Tracy Dean, who spends a good deal of time in white town visiting Nani, the only characters who use the term white town to identify that privileged space are those who cannot move freely in it. Ruth Frankenberg elaborates on the relationship between space and race in such a system. Quote, whiteness is a location of structural advantage, of race privilege. It is a standpoint, a place from which white people look at ourselves, at others, at society, end quote. One effect of standing inside this space is a failure to recognize it as a space. Though the privileged will quickly resort to violence if it is breached. <laughs> uh, the power associated with this territory is twofold. It's a relatively re richly resourced home in which whites engage in the daily dynamics necessary to sustaining privileged life. But more importantly, it, in its namelessness, it is surrounded by an invisible psychological barbed wire fence that gouges outsiders ignorant enough to pass too close to it. Smith's portrayal of the community implies that any position of privilege over others requires destructive betrayal, not only of the other, but also of loved ones, of one's own values, and of one's psychological wholeness. 
The most obvious example of such cost is Tracy's betrayal of Nani. While it seems early in the novel that Tracy might give up his place in Whitetown in order to honor his love for, for Nani, he ultimately cannot withstand the pressure of his mother, preacher Dunwoody, and the white community at large. Not only does he succumb to the attraction of economic security in the shape of farmland offered by his father, but his desire to be accepted by his home community of Whitetown is so strong that he allows his very self to be corrupted. That the lynching and the town's revival meeting both occur on the edge of Maxwell at the climax of the novel is no surprise. If the pecking order of the community seems to be threatened by blacks entering or earning college degrees, joining the army, and or moving north for better paying jobs, the pressure of building in Maxwell finds its release valve in this liminal space on the edge of town. The mob of angry whites who feel that they would lose footing in uh, not getting just payment for a white man's murder, Tracy's murder, catch up to their scapegoat, Henry McIntosh, on the white's ball field near the water tower. The unspoken and hence powerful white identity of the county can be observed gathering its forces, asserting its unspoken dominance. And I'm going to read a long quote. This, to me, is, it just gives me chills reading this. Down the sand roads of the county they had come, Bill and Dee and the others, from Shook Rushton's turpentine farm, the cotton mills, from Harris's sawmill, roads threading widely through the county, curving around Oak Black Lake and Pond, pushing across swamp and hammock, tying its cotton in little gray cabins, its barrels of rosin and its turpentine and tall trees, mule and church and bank, white folks and black, to Maxwell and to each other. Down these roads they came, shadows falling foreshortened and stuffy on palmetto clumps as they plodded along in the heat, hearts as slashed as the pines under which they paused now and then, bodies as drained as the sand on their feet, but white, God-white and immaculate, and now they were on their way to put the inn in his place. Smith's penetrating portrayal of Maxwell's physical and psychological boundaries generates a clear and disturbing mass in the imagination of her readers. Recognizing the familiar and seemingly idyllic ambiance of small-town Southern life in the pages of Strange Fruit, readers must also confront here the soft but brutal borders that control and ultimately dehumanize all the town's residents. Yet Smith's determination to offer us this view reflects her optimism, even as, as it is driven by her fierce insistence that we see and acknowledge the ugliness in common uh, human behaviors. From our seats in 2019, as we reflect on Strange Fruit, as well as on the Civil Rights Movement and other developments and setbacks that have occurred between the novel's 1944 publication date and today, we can see the ongoing need to explore factors of segregation politics and their dynamics. Smith's narrative mapping suggests that understanding geographies and their role in social dynamics is an important step toward a better, integrated, and healthier society. 